Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. On our program today, the roadblocks for people seeking mental health services. Plus a look ahead at the Republican National Convention next week. But first, the recent deadly shootings of black men in Louisiana and Minnesota, as well as the killings of five officers in Dallas, have generated much debate over the relationship between race and police use of force. Law enforcement agencies across the nation and here in the Bay Area are under intense scrutiny amid demands for change. A new study by the Center for Policing Equity found that African Americans are considerably more likely to be subjected to officer use of force than white Americans. UC Berkeley professor Jack Glazer is one of the authors of that report. He joins us now. Also with us is Richmond Police Lieutenant Felix Tan, who manages firearms and tactics training for the department. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Glazer, wanted to start with you. You and your co-authors studied thousands of use of force incidents in 12 police departments across the nation. What did you find? Well, we found that generally speaking across the continuum of use of force from just putting hands on uh, all the way up until what's called less lethal force, like using a taser, that African Americans were more likely to be subjected to force even when we benchmarked against the rates at which whites and blacks and other groups are arrested. So kind of controlling for what you'd expect to see the rate of use of force that there is more force applied to African Americans above and beyond that. Now we also found for lethal force that there was no racial disparity but the numbers are very small and given all the other evidence including data on fatal incidents, uh, we're taking that with a grain of salt. So are you then also taking with a grain of salt another study that's making headlines uh, lately, and that's the one by Harvard economist Roland Fryer, who also found that police are not racially biased when it comes to lethal force incidents. Yes. Um, Fryer looked at a different set of departments, uh, and he, he drilled down deeper into the Houston data and found across the board, again, very similar findings and also with leth lethal use of force, although he found, in fact, in his report that uh, whites were more likely to be subjected to lethal force. And again, that's something that we're very skeptical of because it just flies in the face of all the other data, including fatal uh, incidents, including fatal incidents with off-duty police officers and all of the psychological evidence on how these things play out. And Lieutenant Felix Tan in Richmond, minorities make up the majority. Uh, you manage some of the training there. How is your training different from that of other police departments? Well, our, our police department, we have monthly training, firearms training um, at the range. And a lot of the police departments, they either do it every six months or once a year. So that's a little different. Um, also, since 2007, we've incorporated what's, what's what we're calling force on force training now, which is scenario based training where you have instructors that are actors uh, participating in the training and we pull officers off the street while they're policing and uh, we put them through the scenario training and we evaluate how they perform. And, and how does that work though? How is it different from normal training? Because most of the academies, for example, you shoot at a static target, right? And so the force on force, is it role playing? You play out actual scenarios? Yes, it's, it's actual role playing. Uh, the instructors, the firearms instructors, will pick one or two instructors to participate in this and they're dressed down in civilian clothes. And a lot of these scenarios um, involve police uh, with uh, car stops and sometimes also with um, suspicious persons. So what happens is we have the officers take off their bulletproof vest and uh, take off every uh, live weapon they, that they have on their duty belt and we arm them with uh, what's called, what's known as airsoft guns. And those things shoot off uh, plastic pellets about 300 feet per second. Um, and also they don on a, a face mask to protect their eyes. And, uh, and then we present them a scenario. And one scenario could be, a, you're making a car stop for a car making, um, running a red light. And that is the only information that they receive and they start the scenario. And we have a script for the uh, role player and depending on how the officer reacts, uh, the scenario can go either lethal, non-lethal, or um, nothing happens. And why do you do that? What are you hoping to accomplish through that? Well, a lot of times training at the range, it's, it's, it's really one or two dimensional. Uh, you're, you're standing static, you're at the firing line and you have a firearms instructor telling you you're gonna shoot one or two rounds at this paper target that does not um, engage with you. 
And in real life, you don't even feel the, the impact of when you shoot somebody, right? If you're just shooting at a paper target. That, that's correct. And in real life, you're not waiting for a firearms instructor to tell you to shoot, when to shoot and when not to shoot. So we thought that, you know, it would make sense that we went a step further by having our officers think more about uh, all the level of force that they can use and what they're armed with on their duty belt. And it's, it's very much a thinking game. And has this made a difference in your department in terms of how often use of force is deployed? I would say so. Um, I, I think if you look at our um, amount of officer-involved shootings that we have, it's, it's not as high as um, you would think for a department that finds guns on a daily basis. I mean, we have officers that are always encountering armed uh, subjects and they're able to diffuse um, the tension uh, a lot of times. Professor Glazer, do you think this kind of training could make a difference in terms of the, the types of disparities that you have discovered in your report? Absolutely. The training itself isn't actually targeted at the disparities. It's targeted at f force itself and lethal force and, and pot potentially its excessive use. And to the extent that you can bring down the use of force to lower levels, those racial disparities are also going to be reduced. And I think this is the, at, at this point, I think this is the gold standard of what can be done because it introduces this element of fear and threat into the officer's training that doesn't exist in the target range. And we also reached out to our viewership and wanted to know their thoughts on this. And a number of viewers wrote back, and um, several of them had questions about de-escalation, including a question from Kyle Simmerly on Twitter. And he wants to know if there's training on de-escalation, and if so, what are the methods that you use for that? Well, I'll, that goes in, hand in hand with our force on force training. Lethal force is always the last resort. Therefore, we want our officers to think about the, the outcome and think about what options they have. So and what are some of those options that you go through with them? Well, the very first thing is your presence. And the, and the most important thing is your mouth and your brain, to think about how you can react, how you can mitigate any potential issues and problems. And we train our officers to listen to the subject that they're engaging with. And perhaps the person's having a bad day or has some type of, um, mental um, illness that, they, that needs to be dealt with and the officer's not aware. So then that comes, then that brings into the, the CIT training that a lot of our officers have been trained with. That's crisis intervention training. That's correct. And that to me, to us, is part of de-escalation. Um, so we, we don't only focus on the firearms, it, it, although firearms is very important and we have to hone in the skills. That's just as important as making the, the correct decision. It is a full package deal, and therefore we train a lot. And with, with the amount of training that we do, it gives the officers confidence in their ability to utilize whatever uh, tools they have on their belt. But the most important tool is their mouth and their brain. Do you do implicit bias training as well? Well, we have. We've done it once, and that was about a year and a half ago. Was where, it effective? Uh, well, that's, that's difficult to gauge because um, you're talking about each individual's uh, implicit bias and uh, whether or not it was brought up, surfaced, and whether or not it was um, th it changed them, we, we don't know. So, Professor Glazer, do you think implicit bias training works? Um, as far as we know at this point, the existing implicit bias training doesn't work in terms of re changing the actual performance outcomes on police officers. It works in the sense that officers seem to learn something from it and maybe their explicit attitudes change. But the psychological science on implicit bias indicates that implicit biases are almost impossible to change and they're very difficult to prevent them from influencing your behaviors, which is again why I think the training, the, uh, the actual performance training is potentially more important because what you really want to do is create scenarios and shape scenarios as an officer that prevent the implicit bias, this sort of lower brain functioning from influencing your behavior, that de-escalation, prevent you from getting to that decision point where you're deciding whether or not to shoot in the first place. Well, let me understand this then. So you're basically saying that implicit bias training does not work. Um, if it doesn't, then what works to try to reduce implicit bias? Right. So there are a lot of laboratories around the world trying to figure out how to lastingly reduce implicit bias. And so far, due to no lack of effort, 
we've not found a way to, to, to make implicit racial biases, for example, a preference for whites over blacks or an association between blacks and crime or weapons, to make those go away in any lasting way. They tend to come roaring right back. And that's the nature of the biases. We've learned them over our entire lifetime. You're not going to get rid of them in a couple of hours of training. And so the, what we think is, at this stage, until we figure out a way to really lastingly change them, what we think is more important is changing the circumstances in which they're most likely to be influential. And that means reducing officer discretion and training officers in ways that they can prevent getting from that point in the first place. And just real quickly, um, there's so much outrage over the videos in both shootings in Minnesota and Louisiana. Do you think this could be a tipping point? Honestly, uh, I, I'm afraid not. And mm. I say that because as much as I'd like to be an optimist about it, we've seen this movie before. And these kinds of shootings have occurred before. And it always feels like it's going to be a tipping point, just like Newtown felt it was going to be a tipping point in gun control. And then the news cycle turns, and it's already turned to the, back to the election, mm. back to the vice presidential picks. And it's unfortunately turning to Nice, France as well. So I don't, I don't, see, I don't see anything so qualitatively different this time. Well, it is unfortunately a sign of our, our difficult times that we live in right now. Professor Jack Glazer of UC Berkeley, thank you so much, thank and also you. Lieutenant Felix Tan of Richmond. Well, moving on now, more than 43 million Americans have a mental health condition, but more than half never get help, even those who have insurance. State and federal laws were supposed to fix this, but even in places like the Bay Area, where there's an abundance of therapists, insured patients struggle to find mental health care. KQD health reporter April Domboski explains. On a Sunday afternoon, right. Natalie Dunnage and her boyfriend, so Russell Lifson, head to the park with Natalie's 13-year-old son, Straz. Let's go. You can't kick me from here. He has autism, a developmental disorder that affects about 1 in 70 children in the U.S. You have strengths on one side of your brain and weaknesses on your other side. Like, you know, controlling your emotions or, or this and that, you know. A strengths could be like coding or, you know, focusing on one thing for hours. Each week, an applied behavioral analysis or ABA therapist comes to the house. Are you ready? ABA therapy helps kids with autism learn life skills and how to control their temper. Yeah. Straz and his therapist, Gabby Raiders, create a schedule of carefully timed activities so he can get better at transitions. This is the ID. Right? Uh -huh. The identification for the enemy. This is the width, height, speed X, and speed, speed Y. Ending a favorite activity can trigger a meltdown. I can't do it. I know you can. No, I can't. <laughs> if your kid doesn't get ABA therapy and they're having these really defiant and difficult behaviors, like these are the kids who end up in jail. As a single mom working full-time, money is tight for Natalie. She can only afford a few hours of ABA therapy a week. I want my son to be as successful as possible, so every time I get a raise, I just increase ABA hours. She has insurance through Blue Shield, but getting mental health treatment has been really tough. So I went on the site, and you can see it says, like, doctors, facilities, dentists. Nothing about where to find a therapist. I called them and they emailed me a list of providers. Oh, so this is the list? Mm hmm yeah. They all have a three-month waiting list. And then after the three-month waiting list, you have like a two to eight weeks of intake, and then hopefully you get approved. For so she pays one, two, three, $50 three. an hour out of her oh, own pocket okay. for her son's therapy. And now yeah. she faces similar That's hurdles, too. finding yeah. a clinician for herself. Shield sent me a list, like, I should be fine, just make a few phone calls, I'll find somebody. Um, I called everybody on this list. Um, only one place called me back. I remember they would add... I have to be person. as emotionally healthy as possible so that I can be there for Straz because he has good weeks and he has bad weeks. Turns out that Natalie's experience is by no means unique. I called 100 psychologists in San Francisco who take Natalie's insurance. I'm wondering if you are indeed taking new patients with Blue Shield coverage. 
half said they're no longer taking insurance or new patients, and a quarter never even called back. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Only eight had appointments outside of normal work hours. I contacted Blue Shield for an interview, but they declined. Instead, they sent a statement saying that the provider has to notify Blue Shield if they're no longer taking new patients. They also said California is facing a shortage of mental health providers. Insurance companies are saying that there's a shortage of mental health providers. It's hard for me to believe. They have many colleagues who are trying to get onto panels, and they run into the problem again and again where panels say, sorry, we're closed, we have enough providers in your area. Dr. Hotman is a psychologist who accepts a variety of insurance plans. She can get up to 20 calls a week from people asking for her help. It makes me really angry. It really is upsetting, and it makes me wonder what are the insurance panels doing and why are they limiting how many therapists they take on onto their panels. Why do you think they might be limiting the number of therapists? If you make things too difficult to access, then patients will stop trying to seek the therapy and the treatment that they need. And I guess part of me thinks that that's probably a good thing for the insurance companies. Another difficulty patients face is outdated or missing information about a therapist's specialty. So for instance, if I need a cardiologist for a heart problem and I just get a list of all MDs that are on my health insurance panel, I'm not going to know who to call about my particular issue that I'm needing help with. Many therapists complain that reimbursement rates are too low. Over the past 18 years of being on their panels, they have not increased their reimbursement rates. And yet the co-pays and premiums are increasing for most of my patients. Calvin Hobbs. Under state and federal laws, insurance plans must cover mental health services equally compared to other forms of care. But millions of patients across the country, like Natalie Dunnage and her son Straz, still struggle to get the help they need. We're almost done with this. I like that. Getting services through my plan, the hardest one by far, is getting mental health services. There's nothing more difficult. I needed to find a doctor. I found one instantly. But mental health, behavioral health, psychiatrists, to have that be even harder, it's, it's almost unbearable sometimes. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> And reporter April Domboski is with us in the studio now. April, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So many interesting issues brought up in that story. Why did you do, decide to do the report? I started looking into it about two years ago um, when Kaiser Permanente was fined by state regulators for having problems with mental health access. And um, they were, they were um, patients there were had to wait sometimes up to six weeks for individual mm. therapy appointments. And there were two main reasons why Kaiser got so much attention. Um, one is the fact that they're with the, what is called a closed system. So it's both the insurer and the medical provider at the same time. So that means if somebody calls to get an appointment, there's a centralized record about how long they had to wait. And the other point is that um, the mental health conditions at Kaiser are unionized and they went on strike over these issues. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of attention and it just made me wonder why other insurers weren't getting the same attention because of those things. And so, you know, other insurers, they just, they don't work that way. They have, they contract with thousands of self-employed solo practitioners who all answer their own phones. So it's really difficult to get reliable data about how many people somebody had to call, how long they had to wait, and how many people just give up. So you illuminated some of the problems in your report. You mentioned poor reimbursement rates are a major reason for, for difficulty finding care. Were there any other reasons not mentioned in the story? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, um, Again, these are solo practitioners, and so sometimes they can get up to 20 calls a week from mm -hmm. people who are looking for care. Um, and so they're just overwhelmed, can't return that many phone calls. But also, even if they do call back just to say, you know, I can't, I don't have time to see you, a lot of times people will just immediately launch into telling their story mm -hmm. or explaining their problems. And so not only does that take 20, 30 minutes, but it creates an ethical complication for the therapist because 
they're basically establishing a therapeutic relationship at exactly the time they wanted to say they don't have time to do that. And so that kind of further compounds the, the difficulty in accessing care. Is there a potential greater economic cost to insurers if they don't take care of mental health problems up front? You know, it's hard to say because that's just not the way we've really done it in this country, but there are certainly a lot of studies that have found associations. People who have mental health problems tend to have more complex, more expensive physical health problems. Um, and so there's certainly a lot of arguments being made that addressing mental health problems up front and more consistently could lower healthcare costs overall, but also, you know, further economic costs. If people are not, if their mental health isn't being cared for, they can lose their job and mm -hmm. then um, that becomes even more expensive for society. And we only have about 30 seconds left, but before I go, I have to ask you about the 13-year-old boy in your report, Straz. Has he been able to get therapy through the insurance company since you, de since you did this report? Uh, yeah, we had a version of the story that aired on the California Report on the radio, and the day the story aired, Blue Shield, a representative from Blue Shield called Natalie to ask, yeah how they could help. And um, Natalie said there were a few weeks of haggling and kind of arguing over different policy points, but it looks like he's being evaluated now and looks like he will be getting ABA therapy that's covered by his insurance. Okay, well that's good news. April Domboski, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, we turn now to politics and the upcoming Republican National Convention. KQED Senior Editor for California Politics and Government, Scott Schaefer has more. Thanks, Twee. Well, this morning, Donald Trump revealed his pick for a running mate in a tweet. It's Indiana Governor Mike Pence. With the Republican convention kicking off in Cleveland on Monday, Trump is expected to claim the party's presidential nomination, despite lingering opposition from some quarters within the GOP. Security concerns also loom large, given that the violence uh, we've seen breaking out in other protests at Trump rallies. And joining me now to talk about all that is Republican strategist Sean Walsh. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. Let's start with Mike Pence. Uh, your thoughts about the choice, what impact it could have on the ultimate outcome in November? There's an awful lot of mainstream Republicans who are very, very pleased and relieved of this choice. Number one, that it's not Newt Gingrich. And number two, some concerns about uh, Mr. Christie with regards to a lack of foreign policy. So Mr. Pence brings to the table congressional experience and as vice president, he is the actual go uh, president's representative in the Senate and cast tie-breaking votes, number one. Number two, he was in Republican leadership in the Congress, so should help repair and enhance Mr. Trump with Congress. And number three, actually has extensive foreign policy experience. Nonetheless, a lot of really leading Republicans took themselves out of contention. Nikki Haley, for example, governor of South Carolina. Uh, so this is what he was left with in a way, not necessarily the best of all choices if he had more options. The bottom line is he's a guy who covers a lot of areas of vulnerability or weakness on Mr. Trump's part, so he works. Some would have liked to have seen Joni Ernest, but basically Joni Ernest gives you someone who's just starting out. Senator from Iowa. Exactly. Senator from Iowa and uh, has lack, lack of experience like Barack Obama had himself. The Rules Committee uh, is meeting this week in Cleveland. They're going to set the process for the nomination. And there was a bit of a coup attempt, I guess you could say, uh, a group of uh, opponents of Trump trying to free the delegates to vote their conscience. Uh, that failed. Uh, so what is the significance of that? Uh, actually, nothing. The bottom line was it was expected. The only thing that happened was that it was actually weaker than some people actually expected. It was knocked down and it's no longer a news issue. So put away and done. I, don't, I do expect, though, that there will be some people on the floor that try and do that, similar to what happened with uh, Ron Paul in the last election cycle. So you'll see that on the floor, but it is irrelevant now. So there was a lot of energy in California at one time to stop Trump here when it was still in play. Uh, what happens to all that energy now? Uh, the question is, it probably goes to uh, either hold your nose and vote for Trump or more likely not vote for anybody at all. So I think that's still a huge problem for Mr. Trump is the fact that there's a lot of mainstream Republicans who just probably can't cast a vote for him, particularly Republican women. Well, in fact, if you look at who's going to the convention, I mean, conventions are very high profile events typically with lots of national coverage, chance for networking, face time with important people. And yet there's a large number of Republicans People like Chad Mays, the assembly leader uh, for Republicans here in California, John McCain, Marco Rubio, they're not going. Why? Uh, they're not going because they didn't like the way that Donald Trump ran his campaign. They don't like some of the 
comments he's had with regards to uh, undocumented immigrants coming forward. People have a whole host of reasons why Do they, they worry that it could hurt their own, you know, election or re-election. They think it hurts their own election, re-election. They don't want to be associated with not only the Trump brand, but they don't want the party associated with the Trump brand. But that said, actually, that actually helps Donald Trump because the fewer people you have causing every reporter in the world is you know, coalescing in Cleveland. And so if you actually have people like that that are critical of Donald Trump or make criticism of him on the thing, that makes news. So it actually helps Trump that they're actually not showing up. Yeah. Uh, California is the biggest state, biggest delegation. Uh, how much clout? Does California have at this convention and within the party as we sit here? Well, I don't know if you've seen National Lampoon's vacation, but <laughs> no. it's like Holiday Road every time that bus is coming in from Sandusky. Sandusky, yeah, Ohio we should to just Cleveland. tell people the delegation is staying 60 miles outside of Cleveland in Sandusky, Ohio. So I'll let you draw your own conclusions <laughs> for how important they think California is going to be in this presidential election. Is that, is that sort of a, a slap in the face, put down, backhand, something, whatever you want to describe it? No, I mean, we get that news story every year. I mean, in Tampa, we were way far away from the convention site as well. It, the delegation's the biggest. It's hard to find hotel space for them. And the truth of the matter is, except for money, it doesn't really cast uh, yeah. in its deciding vote. So uh, Kevin McCarthy is one of the speakers, uh, the Bakersfield Republican uh, House Majority Leader. He said earlier this year that he thought with Trump at the top of the ticket uh, that the party could actually pick up some seats in Congress in California. What are your thoughts about that? I think that's probably right. Um, the, much like Brexit, where a lot of people actually lied to pollsters and other folks, Trump does motivate certain people in certain districts to actually come out in bigger numbers. So he may be right. We may actually pick up seats. Quick question, Sean. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk always of the October surprise, the unexpected event that really shifts the race dynamic. This week we saw that another terrible attack in France. What, uh, what do these attacks do to the dynamics of this race? I think quite candidly it, it strengthens Mr. Trump's hand and it makes people have very serious concerns about immigration policy, the protection and strength of our border. I've said this before, I said this on the last time I was on your program, if we have a terrorist attack, someone who comes across the southern border or overstays their visa and does something similar to this, it changes the dynamic of the election fundamentally and really hurts the yeah. Democrats. All right, well, meanwhile, we're gearing up for next week in Cleveland. Fasten your seatbelts, it's gonna be a bumpy ride, perhaps. Indeed. All right, Sean Walsh, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you. And that does it for us. I'm Tui Vu. Thanks so much for watching. For all of KQED's news coverage, please go to kqednews.org.